Well, it's always great to have a good buddy come and speak in chapel. I've actually several good buddies uh, this semester, but uh, Kevin Harney is pastor of Shoreline Community Church up in Monterey. I knew him back in Michigan. Um, I can't say enough about the kind of man he is. He's got the heart of a lion. Uh, he's just, just about fearless, I think. Uh, he manages to do a lot of things with courage and always have fun doing them. And uh, I have never worked so hard uh, for the kingdom as I've worked along Kevin uh, and laughed so much and ate such good food. Uh, Kevin just knows how to live. And he married a babe, uh, all I can say, and, and she just, just dies. But he told me to say it, Sherry. So, uh, but anyway, Kevin Harney has uh, written scads of books. Uh, he always has something that's timely. I know what he's going to talk about this morning. And believe me, uh, this is something we need to hear. So Kevin, we welcome you in the name of Christ. <laughs> Well, I don't know where you grew up, but I grew up in Orange County, California, down the coast from here, and I didn't grow up in a small town. I grew up kind of in an area where every city sprawled to the next city, the next city, kind of, it was paved from Huntington Beach to the San Bernardino Mountains, it was just pavement, and city to city to city, so I didn't grow up in a small town. Some of you grew up in a small town, so you're going to know what I'm talking about in a moment here. Others of you will have no idea what I'm talking about. But about 21 years ago, my wife and I moved to a small town called Byron Center, Michigan. I mean, it's small town. It's, it's uh, outside of Grand Rapids and sort of outside of nowhere. And we moved to this small town. And we have three boys. Our boys are now men. They're 24, 22, and 20. But at the time, they were little guys. And so when we moved there, a couple years into this, they, they came and they said, Dad, we want to go to the Byron Center Parade. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a small town parade, but the whole idea sounded pathetic to me. They said, I said, well, what, what's in the parade? They said, well, you know, kids get to ride their bikes, and there's trucks, like, carrying the junior high football team, and they wave at you, and kids walk, and there's tractors and stuff, and I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to go. I mean, this is pathetic. Now, how many of you grew up in small towns? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? They're small. So they're, they're going, no, every, it's, it's, every says, really fun. You've got to go. And so we're like, we love our kids. So we said, we'll go to the parade. So we go to the small town parade. I still have no idea why anybody comes to this thing. I'm sitting there, and then, I, then about... About three minutes into the parade, we're sitting there, we're talking with, we're talking, people are like, you know, who goes to a small town parade in a small town? The answer is, what? Everybody. everybody. <laughs> and they bring people with them. It's, it's sad. But everybody comes. They're like three or four deep in the streets. I've been to the Rose Parade. That's worth going to, but this is just pathetic. And so we get there, and we're sitting there, and I'm thinking, what are these people doing here? And then like there, the fire truck comes by, and a tractor comes by, and I'm thinking, this, I still don't get it. And then finally, it makes sense to me. In the back of all these trucks where the junior high football players are, where the girls, uh, you know, where the, where the girls, you know, uh, te you know uh, volleyball team is, they're in the back of these trucks and they're going and they all have bags and buckets filled with candy. Is this, is this a, true in all small towns? They have candy. And they're, they like, they're throwing it out to the people on the parade route. And then I figure out why everybody's here. It's not to see their kids. It's the candy. <laughs> right? And so I'm a student of, I'm, I'm a student of human nature. I, as a matter of fact, I've been watching you, and you guys over here quite a bit as I was sitting right there, and I'm always watching and learning. So I'm watching these kids, there's, there's probably hundreds of kids in the back of trucks on flatbeds with bags of candy. And there are fundamentally two kinds of kids and two ways that kids deal with candy in a parade. Okay, there's this kid. The parade starts, they're rolling along the parade, there's this kid. They're rolling down the parade route. And they're just, you know, they've passed all these, you guys, throw me candy! And they're just, you know, they're, and they finally, they find the right candy. And there's this, 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 and they're, they're like, they're like 100 yards down the parade route. And they're looking for someone like this. She's got her hand up in her mouth. And they're, they're, you grew up in a small town, didn't you? They're, like, they're looking for beggars, right? And then they're, they're like, they're like, they're like. <laughs> and, they're, and then they're eventually, like, they see someone they know, and they're like, you, you, me, me, you, me, you, you, me, you. And they're like. And then they started another one. And, it, and like the parade ends, and they've thrown out three pieces of candy. Because they're waiting. They, it's got to be the right moment. The, right, the wind's got to be, everything's got to be perfect, right? That's one kid. And there's, there's a bunch of those kids in there. And I don't know if they think when it's all done, they get what's left or what the deal is. But they don't throw. And then there's this kid. There's this kid. The parade route starts. They're like, they're going to the first row of people. And they're like, ah, ah, ah. And they're just like, you know, they're crazy. And they're just like, they're like reckless, they're out of control, they're insane. And they're just like, they're just like, there you go. They're 
just out of control and they're just throwing candy everywhere. <laughs> they're insane. And they get, they get like, they get 30 yards down the parade route and they're looking at an empty bucket. But they, they're just, they just can't help themselves. That's the two kinds of kids. Now, why did I tell you that story? Because there's a story in the Bible about that story. A story in the Bible about what kind of kid are you going to be as you live your life. And here's the story. It's found in Luke chapter 8. Listen to the story. And if you've heard it before, stay with me. Because I, can, I want to guarantee you, you're going to hear a new perspective. A new way to look at this passage. Luke chapter 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town to a village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who were cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, and goes through all the different people that are there. And verse 4, Luke chapter 8, While a large crowd was gathering, and the people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable, he told this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, scattering the seed, some fell along the path, it was trampled on, the birds of the air ate it up. So, some fell on the rock, and, it was, and as it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. So other seed fell on the good soil and came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And you've probably heard the story before, and you've heard how Jesus kind of expounds on it. I want to just read that part, and I want to kind of hit a pause button for a moment. Because so often when we read the parable of the sower, we talk about the soil. You know, some soil was weedy, and some soil was hard, and all this kind of soil. But I don't think this parable is about the soil as much as it is about the sower. This farmer, this sower, was out of control. This sower did did it all wrong. This sower was reckless, irresponsible, just threw seed where? Everywhere. Everywhere. And, and if you could go back to that culture, or if you've ever had a chance to be in a developing country, and you watch people farm. You know how they farm in developing countries? They'll have, they'll have seed, all right, and they'll go along the ground, and they'll dig a little hole. And they'll put one piece of seed, one seed in. And they'll cover it up. They'll water it. They'll dig another hole. They'll put it in. They'll cover it up. Because the seed is so precious and so expensive, you just don't go throwing it on roads and in weeds. You'd have to be an idiot. Can I say idiot in chapel? Okay, you'd have to be an idiot. I'll say it again. Um, and, and so what they would do is they would, you know, it, today in our world today, if someone is of, even, even in the Salinas Valley where I live, in that area, there's a lot of farmers. They don't just throw seed anywhere. And back in Jesus' day, if someone heard the story, they would immediately be thinking, what kind of a farmer is this? What kind of a farmer throws seed everywhere? You carefully place one seed at a time in a good spot, you water it, and you look for a harvest. And, and I believe what Jesus is getting at is he's painting a picture for you and for me of what our lives are supposed to look like. He's saying, when I give you the seed of my love and my grace and my word and my truth, don't go through the parade of life like this. Should I love this person and serve them in the name of Jesus? Too late, I've rolled past. Should I share? No, maybe. Maybe, okay. Conditions are right, it's perfect, the moment is right, and yet I'm a little, no. Don't go through life like that. But when it comes to the love and the grace and the presence of Jesus, and you guys were thinking up there you got nothing. Pay attention up there, watch now. I don't want to put anybody's eye out. Watch! Look out! See, that's why you got to watch me, okay? You were thinking, you were thinking I didn't know you were up there, weren't you? Watch me now, I'm watching you. All right, and so... Are, are, are you that guy? Are you that girl? Are you that woman? Are you that man who goes through life with the love and the grace and the gospel of Jesus waiting for the perfect moment? Or do you do like Jesus kind of paints a picture of here and do you just scatter the seed of Jesus recklessly, wildly, if you're a note taker, write this down, willy-nilly. Is that a good word? Willy-nilly. Scattering God's grace willy-nilly. Just anywhere you go, everywhere you go. And here's what I'm convinced of in our, in our culture today, and 
particularly, and please hear me, in our Christian culture today. I am, I am a student of Christian thinkers. I am a student of the church. And I've been watching something that absolutely, it both breaks my heart and just pisses me off at the same time. I've been watching teachers and preachers say to people like you, make videos and preach sermons telling Christians, listen, be careful. We Christians are so overbearing and so overwhelming and we're so pushy with our faith. We're offending the world. So let's just take a step back, cool our jets, take it easy. Let's not be that, let's not be that bullhorn guy going, hey, God, why don't you go out and scaring people? Let's just back off. And can I tell you, that's a flat out lie. Christians are not overdoing it when it comes to sharing God's love, grace, and message. We're not. I know this because over the last five or six years, I've been serving, surveying thousands of leaders. I get to speak all over the country, all over the world, and I get to talk with Christian leaders of all types. And I've been asking these two questions. And you try this sometime with a pastor or a leader. You ask them these two questions. I ask this question of Christian leaders. Sometimes it'll be 50, sometimes it'll be 500. I said, let me ask you leaders a question. This is not on the topic I'm talking about, but I've got to ask you this question. I've been doing this survey for a number of years. In your church, in your ministry, in your community, on your campus... Is the big problem with Christians that we're offending the world, overdoing it with the love of Jesus, over-serving, over-loving, over-talking about Jesus, and we're scaring people? Is the general problem in your church, in your ministry, in your community that Christians are scaring people away because they're over-serving, over-loving, and over-sharing? Out of over four or 5,000 people, how many people do you think have said, that's our problem? You know what the answer is? Zero. Not one leader anywhere in the world where I've gone has said that we need to be more careful as Christians. Then I ask the second question. In your ministry, in your community, on your campus, in your church, is the bigger issue that we as Christians are not bold enough, are not reckless enough, do not throw enough of the love of God? Is that more the issue? you all, you got to watch me every second. Don't look away for a second. All right? I'm getting you up there before we're done. Watch me, Okay. <laughs> But it, you know, and I ask you, is the is the bigger issue that we overdo it, overlove, overserve, overshare, overproclaim the saving grace of Jesus? Nobody, you know, everybody says the problem is we're not doing enough. I've not found one leader that says in my ministry, in my community, our people are overdoing it. The real issue is we need to love more, serve more, share more. We need to throw the seed of the love of Christ out more freely. The message of the gospel needs to be shared with greater boldness. And, most, and if you're like most people in this country, particularly, you're going around like this. You know what we do after we go along, enough along the parade route like this? We eventually just kind of go <laughs> and just don't throw anything out there at all. And here's, with, with the moments I have left, I want to, I want to, in the name of the living Jesus Christ, who loves you, who died for you, who rose again in glory, who has filled you with his Holy Spirit, who you just sung to and worshiped, who you're here studying about and on this campus, I, in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to invite you and beg you to become young men and young women and eventually old men and old women who throw the seed of Jesus Christ freely. The beauty of Jesus is this. Every time you look back into the bucket, it's full again. You never run out. The more you love, the more you serve, the more you care, the more you pray, the more you talk about Jesus, the more there is. And the world is longing to hear about what you have. And so many of us Christians have become so gun-shy because there's like one guy in Chicago and a guy in New York and a guy in L.A. who stand with a big, you know, sandwich board screaming at people and scare them off. Are there a few people like that? Yes. Should we pray for them? Yes. But is that you and me? Probably not. And is God's message to us, hey, back off, you're overdoing it. Or is God's message, get a little more reckless. Get a little more bold. And so I want to share a couple ways that you might want to get reckless if you'll open your heart for a couple minutes and listen. God might say something to you that, that causes you to say, I want to be that person. I want to start stepping out in that way. Here's something I'm going to challenge you to do. Live with reckless love. Reckless love. Just say, God, I want to love people no matter where they're coming from, no matter what their background. I want to just love people, especially those who don't know Jesus. How can I love them? I, I've watched my wife now. We've been married for 26 years. 
And I've watched my wife love people like I've seen a few people love in, in the world. We, our boys went through public uh, grade school and public high school. Every beginning of every school year, my wife would go on the campus. She'd go to the administration. She'd go to the teachers. She'd say, I'm Sherry Harney. I'm Zach's mom. I'm Josh's mom. I'm Nate's mom. And if I can serve you in any way, if I can care for you in any way, if I can help in your classroom in any way. She's educated as a teacher. She has a master's in theology. And she just comes and says, if I can, anything I can do. And she would just begin to love these teachers. When we finally, when our last son graduated from Byron Center High School, our boys went through almost their whole life of school through this little small town. When our boys graduated from Byron Center High School, the last one graduated, there was administration and faculty that mourned the fact that Sherry would not be wandering around there anymore, bringing them gifts, caring for them, praying for them, loving them, serving them, and bringing the presence of Jesus. Not a Christian school, public school, but just relentless with love. Where has God put you and where does God put you where people don't know Jesus? Maybe it's your family. I grew up in a non-believing family. I grew up in a family with, with five kids, dad and mom, no faith. I didn't know that Christmas and Easter were religious holidays until I was 17. I had no idea. I had no spiritual framework whatsoever. The only part of the Bible I knew was the little part that Linus does in the Charlie Brown Christmas when he explains to Christmas, uh, you know, to, to Charlie Brown about from the Gospel of Luke. That's the only Bible I knew. When I first read the Bible and I came to it, I thought, they ripped this off from Linus. I didn't know. I didn't know. Nothing. And some of you will leave here and you'll go back home to a non-believing home. Love. Don't go home and judge your parents. Don't go home and judge your brothers and sisters. Love them. Be relentless. Just take the love of Jesus wherever you are and just get ready. Throw it out there. Sorry, Ben. I think I hurt you there. So, so, so just say reckless love. Reckless love over and over again. Second thing, reckless service. Just look for opportunities to serve especially those who don't know Jesus. Can I help with that? What can I do to help you there? I remember when we, there's this couple, T and Sue, wonderful couple. They own this little, uh, little Chinese place called Peking Inn, right by our house. We started going to eat there. When they opened the place up, they were not believers. And we looked at this couple, and we just loved them. So I kept saying, how do you serve somebody who, you know, they work at a restaurant. Their job is to serve you. So you go get your food, eat, and leave, right? No, you say, how can I serve them? So they actually opened up this little, it was kind of cute. They, had a, they wanted to open up a little buffet, but they only were able to buy like one little one, so it had like about eight or nine little things on it. Like this little, little junior, not these places with like 400 things, but like eight or nine little items in their buffet. And then they had handwritten on these little placards the different kinds of food. And they put it up, they kind of bent them in half and set them up on top of there. And it was just, you know, it was just kind of messy and not done very well. But they were just trying. So I took their, I got one of their menus and I took it back to the office. And I said, hey, let's make a, a nice placard for every item on the menu. Let's laminate it, let's fold them, let's put them in a little case, alphabetize them, and give it to them as a gift. I got free little um, donut hole, cinnamon sugar donut holes, like for the rest of my life for this. <laughs> a nice side benefit. It's not why I did it, but hey, free donut holes, right? So, but but I, I came with this little box, and I gave it to them. You, you would have thought... You would have thought I had given them a box of gold. It was just little placards for the, all the things, in the, but it just, it said, I, 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 wanna, I just want to, we made these for you. For, uh, the staff at Corinth Church, we made these for you. They were blown away that we would serve them because their whole life is serving other people and nobody stops and says, what can we do for you? You can do that every day. Recklessly. When I say be reckless, I don't mean be stupid and irresponsible. I mean think, how can I serve? How can I love? What can I do to show the presence and the love of Jesus? Because of those reckless serving acts, eventually like when the, when the, when the Passion of the Christ came, that movie showed, they went to that movie with us. They, they, they wanted to hang, they, we spent time, they became our friends because we loved them and it opened the door to bring the message and the love of Jesus as we love them, as we serve them. Reckless love, reckless service. Here's something that we don't think about very often. I want to give you a very clear challenge. Offer reckless prayers. Pray for people over and over. For non-believers. And watch this. Listen close. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. This is so powerful. God can use you in this. Pray with those who don't know Jesus. Don't ask them to pray, but you're talking with somebody and they share a concern. It's, it's a, stu a student you know in another school, someone in the community here. They don't know Jesus. They share a concern. Just look at them and say, hey, can I take a minute and just pray real quick for you right now? Do you know, in the last 25 years that I've been doing this, I've never had anybody tell me no. Somebody will someday tell me no. But nobody has so far. Atheists, people of different religions. I, I had a woman, we were, we were in a restaurant, a little, a little Italian place, in this restaurant, and this woman was, uh, the biblical term is great with child. She was very pregnant. 
And a lot of times at a restaurant, I'll say to the, not always, but sometimes when it seems right, I'll say to the server, hey, when we get our meal, we're going to say a prayer for our meal. Is there anything we could pray for you for? And, and I'd say 50% of the time they have a night, something, 50% of the time they say, oh, think about it, and they don't share anything, that's okay. But, but most of the time, they'll come back with a prayer need. This woman looks at me, and she says, will you pray for my baby? I said, sure, when our food comes, we'll say a prayer for your baby. I said, you know, if it's a boy or a girl, we had a little chat. And it was so sweet. When she brought the food, she served the food, and instead of walking away from the table, when it came time for our prayer, I was, stand, I was sitting on the end. She walked to the table, she set her food down, and she turned and she slid her belly on top of the table right in front of me. <laughs> I'm like, am I, am I supposed to let, I don't, you know, I didn't, uh, and so I didn't do that, but I'm like, you know, and so I just, and so we prayed, we prayed for her baby, and when her baby was born, and when she was back, and obviously no longer pregnant, we talked about it, we shared her joy, I, I had a young woman, I was, I was, I was studying for a sermon at a, at a little restaurant called Don Jose's in Huntington Beach, and uh, leaving, and the girl behind the counter Said, as I'm walking out, I'm paying my bill, and she says, she saw my Bible, she said, something like, are you religious or something? I said, well, I'm actually a pastor. And she goes, oh, I like pastors. I said, great. And um, she said, will you bless me? And she's standing behind the cash register, behind the counter, she said, will you bless me? What do you do when someone says in the entry to a restaurant, will you bless me? I said, sure. So she goes like this, it was so sweet, she goes like this, she goes, and she leans as far as she can over the counter. So I'm like, okay, boom. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. And I gave her Aaron's blessing. And it made me wonder how many people do you run into in a day who don't have the courage to say, will you bless me? But they need a blessing. They need a prayer. And you can bring the presence of Jesus just by praying for people and with people in their times of need or their times of joy. And, and then, so, so reckless love, reckless, and I can't tell you all, I can't tell you what to do. All I can do is say this. You look at people who don't know Jesus and say, how can I love you? How can I serve you? How can I pray for you? And start doing it, and you're going to come to that moment, you're going to come to that moment in the next two or three days, in the next three or four hours, where God opens the door, and there's an opportunity, and you can share his love and his grace, and you're going to look at it, and you have to decide. And before you can think too long about it, just throw it. Just do it. See, you're good. You were waiting for me. See, you knew what was going on here. And just do it. And then one more thing, reckless conversations. Share your story about the presence and the power of the living God. You have met the Savior of the world. You know him. You love him. He's transformed you. Even if right now you're at a time where you're struggling, you're asking questions, and some of you are, I know that, you still know the presence and the love of God and what the world longs for, you have. So talk about Jesus. Well, should I talk right now about Jesus? I'm, oh, maybe. And the parade goes on and you wander by. Just do it. Be reckless with your conversations. I was, I was flying on a plane landing in, in, in San Jose. And this woman sitting next to me, when she sat on the plane, her and her husband both had John Grisham novels on their laps, which was his code on the plane for leave me alone. So we didn't talk at all, but near the end of the flight, she looked on, she, was, she said to me, you preach a lot, don't you? She was look, I said, well, you snoop on people's computers a lot, don't you? Because she was looking at my schedule. She said, yes, I do. I love to watch people's computers on planes. I act like I'm reading and I look at their computers. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> She's honest. And I said, uh, I said, where are you coming from? And she said this. She said, I've been on a year traveling. I took a year off work. I'm a vice president for a large bank. I took a year traveling to try to find out why I'm on this planet. And I said, I said did you figure it out? She said, the saddest word in the world. She said, no. She told me all the places she traveled, all the things she'd done. Diving in Tahiti and climbing in Australia and all over the world. She hadn't found it. And I, at that moment, I had to make a decision. I said to her, can I tell you how I found my purpose and meaning in life? And here was her response. Would you? And so I told her about growing up in a non-believing home and meeting Jesus. And about his love and his grace and his gospel. And that he died on the cross. And I believe with all my heart that he is who he said he was. And he's changed my life. She gave me her information. And I was just landing. I said to her, can I pray for you? Again, she said, would you? And it was kind of sweet. She kind of, she didn't want to grab my hand, but she just, she was, her husband was here, she was here, I was here. She goes like this, and she just kind of leans against me. <laughs> and I prayed for her. And, and you have to decide. I promised in the corner here, I got to close in prayer, but I promised up here. You have to decide how you're going to live your life, what you're going to do. Watch your eyes. Be careful. Third round. There you go. You're part of things there. Here's what I want to, oh, big move behind the back.
Before I pray, I want to share one last thing. Okay, before I pray, I want to share one last thing. You guys, oh yeah, I, you, you're begging, aren't you? You're pathetic. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> every day for the rest of your life, every day for the rest of your life, moments will come. And you'll hold the love and the grace and the message of Jesus in your heart and in your hand. And you will decide how you're going to live and what you're going to do. And my hope and prayer is that you do this. <laughs> Sit in the front row next time. Let's pray. God, we love you. We bless you. We celebrate your goodness and your grace. And we thank you that we have received the words of life. Help us never be stingy. Help us never hold back. Help us become reckless with your love and your grace, even as you recklessly bled and died and gave all for us. We consecrate ourselves to give all for you. Be glorified, be lifted up, and Lord, be quick on our lips and deep in our heart and in our hands as we serve, that we might bear great witness to who you are and what you've done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.